Welcome to Undiscarded Stories of New York, a podcast brought to you by the City Reliquary Museum and Civic Organization in Brooklyn. Today I'm talking to Michael Michonne. He's a native New Yorker, a historical activist, and served as the Manhattan Borough Historian from 2006 until 2019. What's a historical activist? Many historians basically study history and put stuff out there and just kind of leave it out there. In my role as the borough historian, and just my personality lends itself to being a little bit more assertive in the, in the things that I learn. And I feel very strongly that many things should be known by the public. And so I've got a couple of particular interests. I try to raise awareness for these things and encourage the celebration of these things, be it with public ceremonies, events, lectures, and recognition by the city government. Being the former borough historian, I have the pleasure of selecting my passions. And those passions are the things that I am an activist for. Got it, got it. Well. I can totally see why a reliquary is a good fit for you. Absolutely. This place is fantastic. What an expression of New Yorkiness. I try to promote it whenever I can. I wish all New Yorkers were aware of it. It is just, it's just so rich, so fun. And that's what history should be. It should be fun. So that brings me to our artifact today, which is this stuffed taxidermied alligator on the ceiling of the entryway of the reliquary. And it's very reliquary-esque because I think its tail is falling apart a little bit. It looks a little (laughs) worse for wear. (laughs) He's definitely been through. He or she has been through a lot. You know, whenever I see an alligator on the roof like that, you know, I'm from Pakistan. We always had lizards crawling Uh, on the floors and the ceiling. And it was like a game of chicken of when it was going to fall down. But I think we're pretty secure sitting over here where we can see it from afar. If it does drop, it won't hit us. We're we're, (laughs) we're a little bit removed from its trajectory. So, um, Um, I'm going to ask you, why should this alligator be here in the city reliquary? It's because it's part of what I call New York City's greatest true-ish urban legend. When I was growing up as a kid uh, in Brooklyn, by the way, I heard the claim, let's call it that for now, that there were live alligators in the New York City sewer system. And it was pervasive among New Yorkers. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what they're telling kids these days, but that was a very well-known claim. And of course, with something like that, people either totally believed it or totally poo-pooed it as being a myth, you know, something to scare the kiddies. And a lot of people just in between, they didn't quite know, is it true, right? But I always thought that Boy, oh boy, of all the New York City urban legends, of all the New York stories, it is the best one. And I, I just fell in love with it as I was a kid. And of course, as when I became an adult and a researcher, I got the opportunity to do a deep dive into the legend of the New York City sewer gator. So let's talk a little bit about this myth and legend. There is a definite headline behind it, right? It didn't just come out of nowhere. Like it was reported in the New York Times. So I, I tell you what, I'm gonna, I think we should go back deeper I mean, because there is a history behind it. So it's, it's, it, it's not just a moment in time when this legend just sprang out of nothing, which is one of the things I found in my research, okay? So uh, there have been encounters, for lack of a better word, with alligators in what is now New York City and the surrounding area for centuries, for centuries, right? I didn't know that. The first encounter I was able to discover was in 1815, and that's near Newtown Creek, you know, which is the divider between Brooklyn and Queens. There was another encounter in 1818 on the East River near Wall Street, another encounter in 1838, basically where the Brooklyn Navy Yard is today, and another encounter up in the South Bronx in 1877. These encounters were, I found them as as references in newspapers, old newspapers, and they're usually pretty pretty quick little references. Although the first encounter, that I, the oldest one I was able to discover, 1815, had a pretty decent write-up. Would you like, to, would you like me to 
Yeah, let's describe what happened. Sure. So this citation comes from the Long Island Star of August 23rd, 1815. And it reads, an alligator measuring three feet, six inches was shot in a swamp about three quarters of a mile from Bushwick Ferry on Saturday afternoon last by John T. Browery. While in the act of leveling his piece, that means his gun, right? At a flock of snipes, snipes are little birds, he discovered the alligator within a, within a few yards of the spot where he stood, making towards him. He instantly lodged the contents of the piece in the throat of the monster, who now adds to the catalog of natural curiosities exhibited at Scudder's American Museum. So Scudder's American Museum was basically like a taxidermy museum at the time. But yeah, so that, that was the first encounter I came across. Now, of course... Alligators do not naturally occur at these latitudes, right? And in the course of telling the story of these alligator encounters, one might think, okay, they were naturally occurring at the time, right? But they've since gone extinct. As the area has become more developed, more civilized, they've been wiped out. And any naturalist will tell you that is not the case. The natural range of alligators is approximately the latitude of Virginia, right? Because anything further north of that is just too cold for alligators to survive or thrive. And so these early encounters are all almost assuredly from alligators that have been brought artificially inserted into the area. Now, remember, New York was and remains one of the greatest seaports in the world. So there was constant international travel in and out of the area. So these creatures to have been brought aboard ships and then let loose or have escaped from ships wouldn't be an unreasonable thing. And of course, it was a relatively rare thing or they wouldn't have made the newspapers, right? So once we start talking about alligator encounters, probably from the middle 1800s into the 20th century. I strongly suspect that the sources of those gators are either escaped or released pets. Pets. And I've got some reason for suspecting that. One area of research that I'm very familiar with is the creation of Central Park. So Central Park was built basically from 1857 to about 1872, thereabouts. And the original design of Central Park did not include a menagerie, what they called a menagerie, now a zoo, the Central Park Zoo. One reason that the zoo exists is because basically people donated animals to the park management while the park was being built. These were unsolicited donations, right? What would happen is wealthy people would take trips overseas or down south, and they would purchase or acquire somewhat exotic animals, and they would bring them back as pets for themselves or for their children or for whatever, and those animals would would grow unmanageable, or they'd just get bored with them. Or they find out, you know, a wild animal is not something you want to keep on a Fifth Avenue mansion or whatever have you. And so their first option for disposing of the thing was basically to haul it off to Central Park, knock on the door of the arsenal, which is where the management of the park was, and say, here, take my ocelot, take my rattlesnake, take my spider, right? And the assortment of animals that they got is just mind-boggling. Right now I'm staring at a page from the Central Park Commission Annual Report of 1865, and it's just one page of several pages that catalog these animal donations to the park in this period. It covers about a six-month stretch of time, and in that six months, I've got circled here four alligator donations one of which has is a dead alligator, a stuffed alligator, the other three are live alligators. And there are beavers, possums, ringtail monkey, peafowl, Cuban game fowl, peccary, ocelot, turtles, hawks, raccoon, 
eagles, red fox, black bear. And that this is and this is just one page. I'm just like getting okay. so stressed for these, you know, <laughs> zookeepers because I'm thinking, okay, there was no internet then. They're getting all these exotic animals from God knows where, and they're trying to figure out how to like keep them alive. <laughs> yeah, ta- I'm showing Tanya another an illustration. This was published in Harper's Weekly, showing the menagerie and all these wacky animals. Look at that. I've got a list here. Can oh you? My God. These are the animals that populated the menagerie in this early period of Central Park. And most, if not all Prairie of these, <laughs> were donated mostly by affluent New Yorkers who got bored of their pets. So I guess February 9th, 1935 is when the greatest urban legend was born. Maybe not the greatest, but one of them. (laughs) The greatest true-ish urban legend. So in the 1930s, there was a rash of alligator sightings in the New York City area. For example, in 1937, there was a very little alligator found in the subway system. Also in 1937, there was a four-foot alligator. And judging by the picture I'm looking at, he's basically the size of the guy we've got hanging off the reliquary ceiling. Maybe it's him. Maybe Maybe it's him. him. Um, Anyway, and he was caught by a boat captain down near Wall Street on the East River. Some boys were swimming around. They did that back in the 30s, right? And the captain who was working nearby on his boat heard some screaming, looked over, saw this alligator in the water with the boys, fashioned a lasso out of the rope he had with him, lassoed the thing, and basically decided, according to the article that I read with the photo, that he was going to keep it as a pet. Oh, my (laughs) God. There were alligator sightings in the Bronx River, north of the city as well. So there was a rash of these sightings happening in the 30s. And the one, the pivotal one, the one that sort of makes history, changes history, also happens in the 30s, in 1935, February 9th, 1935. And the story takes us to East Harlem, East 123rd Street to be precise. It's February, so snow has recently fallen in the city. And some neighborhood teenagers decided that, you know, let's shovel some snow, clear the sidewalk. And that's what they proceed to do. So they're shoveling the snow down a sewer grating. And one of the boys nearest the sewer noticed some rustling down below. And he gets down on his knees, peers down. And sure enough, what he spots is an alligator, a live alligator. He calls the other boys over. They peer down. Sure enough, it's an alligator, right? I think it's best if we take we turn to some newspapers so give you some f- yeah fr- let's hear it. source accounts of how this unfolded. Okay, so this comes from the New York Herald Tribune, who wrote a very long article the following day. It's an alligator, cried James Mitreno. Now, Salvatore Condolucci threw down his shovel and raced to the house, into the house where he managed to snatch his mother's clothesline from a hook without arousing parental suspicion. Salvatore wanted the alligator, just why he could not explain. But the urge to capture the creature was upon him and was irresistible. Clutching his lasso, he swung himself down into the manhole, landing astride the denizen of the place, which, upon contact, he was certain was an alligator. He slipped the noose over the reptile's head, drew it taut, and was hoisted to the street again by his companions, the end of the clothesline in his hand. The three boys grasped the rope and hauled to East 123rd Street, a veritable alligator, eight feet long. Wow. Wow. Shall I continue? Yes, please. (laughs) So now the New York Times takes over the story, and from them we read, Slowly, with its curving tail twisting weakly, the animal was dragged from the snow 10 feet through the dank cavern and to the street where it lay, non-committal. I love that word, non-committal, right? I think that's what you'd like an alligator to be if you encounter it. (laughs) Unfortunately, it doesn't stay that way. Uh, It was not in Florida, that was clear. And therefore, when one of the boys sought to loosen the rope, the creature opened its jaws and snapped not with the robust vigor of a healthy, well-sunned alligator, but with the fury of a sick, very badly treated one. The boys jumped back. Curiosity and sympathy turned to enmity. 
let them have it, they cried. Yeah, you can figure out what happened next. With the shovels, they proceeded to beat the alligator to death. How old were these boys? They were all aged in the teens, the late teens, I think 15, 16, 17, thereabouts. Yeah. So, so man, It okay. sounds great. Sure. I'm enjoying myself. So, so then we're back to the New York Herald Tribune. With one accord, the three volunteer street cleaners seized their shovels and attacked the alligator in the St. George Manor. Do you recognize that reference? St. George slay the dragon, right? While the erstwhile sidewalk scoffers goggled at a respectful distance. The affray was hard on the shovels, but the alligator suffered too. Within five or six minutes, it no longer snapped its jaws or hissed or even wriggled. To all appearances, it was a dead alligator. Feel bad for the alligator a I little totally bit. I totally do. I do. <laughs> and I got to tell you, this is such a fun story, but it really breaks people's hearts when I get to the end. I always warn them in advance, this is not going to have a happy ending. So I prep them just a little Spoiler bit. Spoiler alert. Spoiler <laughs> alert, exactly. All right, back to the New York Times. Triumphantly, but not without the inevitable reaction of sorrow, see? The boys took their victim to the Lehigh Stove and Repair Shop. There it was found to weigh 125 pounds. They said it measured seven and a half or eight feet. It became at once the greatest attraction the store ever had. Now, when I turned up these stories, and mostly the article in the Times is pretty well known. For people who are interested in researching this story, most people find the Times story. But before I dug a little deeper in the past few years, it was kind of the only story out there. And if you're a historian and you use newspapers in your research, you know that you can't always trust 100% the accuracy of these stories, especially if you only have one account to go by. And even though it is the New York Times, there's the possibility that the reporter was pranked or he was bamboozled or got it wrong or phoned it in or whatever, right? On further digging, I found two more articles, lengthy articles, one of which I quoted from here in addition to the Times, that was the Herald Tribune. But the New York Daily News also covered the story. Now, when I was growing up, the New York Daily News prided itself as being New York City's picture newspaper. They ran more pictures than any other newspaper in the city. And when I found the story in the Daily News, there it was, an image of the alligator being held by the boys. And you see it from the tip of its tail to the top of its snout, all people crowding around them. The boys were identified. And so this was undeniable evidence that this was not just one wacky urban legend. It was true. Have you seen the picture, by the way? Oh, wow. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? That's massive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm more impressed with the fact that they felt like they could kill that thing. <laughs> it was it was weakened, obviously. Given the temperature of the surroundings, it was not a robust animal, so I'm sure it didn't take that much. <coughs> and anyway, so the story was carried not just in New York City papers, it also ran on the wires. That may, basically means it was sent out to other newspapers that also carried the story all around the country and even in Canada. So you can say the story went international. Right? It went viral. <laughs> it went viral, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so that's why I call it New York City's greatest true-ish urban legend, because we know that this encounter happened, but do alligators live there on a long-term basis in vast numbers? No. I mean, most naturalists would tell you that alligators could not survive in that kind of environment, certainly not for very long. Perhaps they could survive for weeks, but not on an extended period, especially given the weather of New York, right? With the cold temperatures, the snow, things like that. No, but this did, this one encounter was true. So I, as, I, as I showed, in the 1930s, there was this rash of alligator encounters, sightings, findings, right? And so what's responsible for that? And here's where my theory takes on a 20th century twist in the sense that I talked about the donated animals of the Central Park Menagerie from the 1800s. Once we're in 
the 20th century into the 1930s, I still think we're dealing with basically escaped and a loosed, loosened, loosed pets, right? But where are they coming from? Because 1930s, the Depression, you don't have too many rich kids going overseas or parents going overseas, bringing ocelots back from Africa or wherever you get an ocelot, right? But this was an era of the comic book and the boys' magazine. So in the back of comic books and particularly boys' magazines, there would be pages and pages and pages of advertisements specifically aimed at young and teenage boys. Magic tricks, blueprints for building tree houses, pranks, handshake buzzers, and things like that. Radio kits, build a crystal radio, right? And I remember this. These things still ran when I was a kid in the 60s and the 70s. And one of the things in these ads would be mail order alligators. Wow. <laughs> so here are a couple of ads. And that's an original, original Christmas gift, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. And we're not talking about expensive. We're talking about baby alligators that would cost you about $1.50. And these would come mail order from Florida, from Louisiana, from California, and they'd be boxed up and shipped through the U.S. mails, nothing special, nothing different. It was legal by regulations and remains legal to this day, by the way. You can still send small live animals through the mail. So here's a picture of, what is it, the Los Angeles alligator farm. And there are the boxes that these are going to go in. There's the gators that are going to go in the boxes. Wow. They're you, tiny. I have, to, I have to say, Tanya, you look a little, you look terrified. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, well, they do, like I said, I, you know, I used to play chicken with the lizards above my head and all like, they, they, go, yeah. they look like lizards. And for some part of me is like, didn't they know they weren't going to stay babies? <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Just since I have it here. So this is the current day postal regulations. And you notice I've circled it in red. You can still mail alligators and all these other creatures. And it makes sense because there are places that have legitimate needs for little animals, and uh, it's relatively harmless to send these animals through the mail. We're talking about laboratories, we're talking about zoos, we're talking about pet shops, things like that, that have legitimate need for this sort of thing. Now, did they grow up? Yes, they did. Alligators are not like goldfish. You put a goldfish in a little jar, it stays little. Put it in a bigger jar, it grows bigger. Alligators are gonna keep, as long as you feed them, they're gonna grow. And for example, here's another story from the 30s about a woman in Queens who was sent an alligator as a pet from some friends of hers in Florida, and she kept it in her bathtub until eventually it became too big for the bathtub, and she went to the county clerk's office asking for help, and the county clerk, some assistant in the county clerk's office basically just called the ASPCA, and they, they came and took the alligator away. But yeah, alligators will outgrow their their enclosures because they is like I said as long as you feed them they keep on growing. Yeah, I think people still learn that these days. You know, uh, I'm I'm trying to think like a baby tiger is cute. And you know the story about Ming, right? The Ming, the full grown tiger that was kept. Oh, why don't you tell me? Oh my goodness, yeah. So Ming is a uh, oh I wish I remember the date. I think it was in the 1990s. Uh, a gentleman who lived, believe it or not, in public housing in Manhattan kept a full-grown tiger in his five-bedroom public housing apartment. And to me, the most shocking thing about this story is, how do you get a five-bedroom apartment in Manhattan? The second I must be a New Yorker now because that's where my mind went <laughs> yes, first. exactly. <laughs> and the second shocking thing is a full-grown tiger, yes. And so eventually somebody found out about this. And so the authorities basically were able to tranquilize the tiger and bring it bring them to some preserve or whatever have you. There is this classic, famous, if you don't know it, you got to find it online, front page of either the Post or the Daily News that shows a view looking into the window of the apartment building. Repelling outside the window is a cop or some other animal control officer. And staring back at him from inside the window is this full-grown tiger face. It is priceless. Wow, wow. And Ming just died about three years ago, by the way. 
So uh, this has flown by. So now we get to the point in my story. We actually have a day where we celebrate the occurrence of alligators in the city. I have a date. I don't know if we have a date, but I have a date. So because I think this is one of the great monumental milestones of New York City history, the date that this urban legend, this true-ish urban legend was born, it needs to be celebrated. And so the date of that East Harlem encounter was February 9th. And so I was the Manhattan Borough historian when the 75th anniversary of the East Harlem encounter was coming up. And I thought somebody, namely myself, should do something about this. And so on the 75th anniversary, which was 2010, I got a proclamation from the borough president, Scott Stringer, to declare that day alligator in the sewer day. And there you go. It's official. It's official. (laughs) Sure. Why not? And every February 9th ever since I have been in some way, shape or form celebrating alligator in the sewer day. So tell me, how does one celebrate alligator in a sewer day? That's a good question. It always comes upon me kind of in a rush. It varies. A lot of times I'll give a lecture telling the story that I just told you. And sometimes I remember I did a, a what I called a legendary New York City trivia quiz. One time we did a screening of a documentary that a woman from India had made about the fabrication of New York City's manhole covers. Now, I haven't seen this lately, but there was a time, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, where it seemed every New York City manhole cover was made in India. It would say that, right? And she went back to India and she filmed that whole process, basically from start to finish. A very labor-intensive, very dangerous process. And when I heard about her documentary, which I think won a couple of awards, I said, well, that's, that fits into alligators in the sewers, right? Because underneath those manhole covers They're are sewers. the sewers. <laughs> How are you going to celebrate this February 9th? So uh, I, I always vow, you know, Mike, you got to start working on this sooner than later. But I think that this discussion with you today has put me in an alligator in the sewer state of mind. And so I'm going to give it some serious thought what I'm going to do. And you'll be the first one to know. Mm, thank you so much. And this was really fascinating. My pleasure. Totally my pleasure. This has been Undiscarded, Stories of New York, a podcast brought to you by the City Reliquary Museum and Civic Organization in Brooklyn, New York, in partnership with Citizen Racecar. My name is Tanya Muhammad, and I produce this show in collaboration with David Hoffman, who edits the stories. Post-production and original music by Jose Miguel Baez. Contributing producer, Jacob Ford. Production manager, Gabriela Montequin. Outreach manager, Sarah Shalantano. And a special thanks to Dave Herman. To learn more about these artifacts, check out undiscarded.org. And be sure to follow at City Reliquary on Instagram for facts and pictures. Head to cityreliquary.org to hear about the museum's mission, exhibits, and events. If you enjoyed this episode of Undiscarded, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review and help spread the word. There are so many more stories to tell.